Association of Scholars. I'm Scott Turner. I'm the director of the Intrusion of Diversity in the uh, Sciences Project at the National Association of Scholars, and uh, I'm the host of the uh, webinar. Uh, our guest tonight is Dr. John Armstrong. Uh, he's from uh, King's College London. He's a uh, reader in financial mathematics, has, had, has quite a bit of experience working in industry and academia, and uh, he's I can, just looking through his CV. I can say that he's a real mathematician. He's a uh, He's uh, um, he's he's no slouch when it comes to that, and we have him on tonight because of an article that he published not too long ago in the Spectator, and I'll just give you the title of it, which is uh, an interesting one. Uh, it's called "The Sinister Attempts to Decolonize Maths," which uh, seems like a strange. Um, a subject for decolonization. So uh, welcome, John. Uh, we're very glad to have you here, and uh, we're looking forward to a, a fun conversation. And uh, I thought we'd just start out by by you telling us uh, the story of your article. I mean, decolonize math decolonizing math mathematics, what's that all about and why? Well, so the reason the issue crossed my desk in the first place is that I'm the... Um, and what's called the director of programs at King's. So I've got an education role and I have to look after what we decide to teach and just look at the basic structure of the modules and that kind of thing. So I'm sort of just keep our program up to date. And so I was asked to look at this consultation document um, from the Quality Assurance Association for Higher Education in the UK. And what that was, was a document defining the basic sort of contents of what you'd expect of a mathematics degree in the UK. So it's what's called a subject benchmark state, subject benchmark statement. And they'd updated it. And part of that was it said that all mathematics courses should take a decolonial view of mathematics. Um, and... I happened to know a reasonable amount about the um, sort of intellectual underpinnings of the theory of decolonization. And um, I, I found it quite a concern. It wasn't the only concern with the document because it actually also said that we need to start including sustainability in mathematics and employment and entrepreneurship. I mean, all of these sound like great things, but they're not mathematics. And so the document more broadly was trying to push mathematics teaching at universities away from mathematics. And so I, I thought that was um, quite a serious concern. Um, and um, what I did was I organised um, a letter with, um, I contacted a large number of prominent mathematicians. Well, what I actually did was I asked locally and the mathematicians of colour in my department, what they thought. I mean, they weren't, they don't have a completely uniform view, of course, as you'd expect. But I, I got the letter to a state where um, they were happy with it. So a number of them agreed to sign the letter. And then I sent it out to really quite high profile mathematicians, mostly fellows at the Royal Society. And we got quite a number of them agreed to put their name to it as well. So that got covered in the uh, Times Higher Education. And then as a result of that, I was asked um, by the spectator to write a piece about it, um, explaining what decoloniality might have to do with mathematics. Um, okay, and, and uh, you know, you, you made some very interesting points in that, in that article. Uh, I'm just going to quickly put the uh, address of that into the uh, into the chat uh, for everyone to see. Um, but you know, you you made some very interesting points in there. That uh, you know, for example, um, you know, who's colonizing whom? You know, you made the point that uh, that uh, our, our entire number system comes from the Islamic world. Uh, uh, that uh, that that. that 
that that the penetration of this into uh, European culture was through the uh, the Islamic conquest of North Africa and moving into Spain and and uh, recovery of of Greek uh, math mathematics through that channel and so forth and and uh, you also made the point that uh, Native American tribes uh, like the Inca were doing uh, some actually quite sophisticated uh, no the Maya doing some quite Maya. sophisticated yeah d doing some quite sophisticated mathematics so so on what grounds would the the QAA say that you know mathematics is in need of decolonization when in fact kind of uh, you know colonization well, it, it all depends yeah what on earth you mean by decolonization yeah so this is the big mystery and this is really the QAA didn't make that a hundred percent clear and there are lots of different interpretations out there as to what decolonization might mean. Mm -hmm. um, the QAA um, seemed to hint that they thought we should teach about the history of mathematics, but they gave a completely different version of the history of mathematics to the one you've just made. So you instantly think about the, the Maya, but they actually wanted that bits of history they asked us to teach with the fact that some mathematicians, such as Teichmuller, um, had connections with the Nazi party, and some um, statisticians, um, R.A. Fisher, I think, in particular, um, were interested in eugenics. So they told very explicitly, they said, you should cover those areas. So they took the whole history of mathematics and focused in, zoomed in on two areas where we're not, not deep now, but it's obviously of mathematics, but they ignored the entire rest of the history. So you've given you know some of the highlights there. Um and you know as you say it's just hugely um international. It's always been an incredibly international pursuit. Um so for example um the number zero um was I think first possibly first came from China, but the, the actual digit we know for sure was used in India, and then it was brought by Arab mathematicians. Eventually, finds its way through the Moorish conquest of Spain to Europe. That's that's how we got the number zero. And the Maya, I think, the really the, the number zero is the sort of really sophisticated things that we know that they had in their mathematics as well. So that's independently invented in two areas. So, you know, really, really shows not only that math is international, but also that there's something fundamental about mathematics that really exists irrespective of human culture. And actually that was the main point I was trying to make in the article was that what de decolonization, if you, if you look at the theory of decolonization, what it says is that the paradigm, the European paradigm of rational knowledge was really created to oppress um, minority groups. And that, that's an astonishing statement, but that, that phrase, the European paradigm of rational knowledge, it's, it's not my own. It comes from a, a paper by Tijano, who is one of the um, founders of the theory of decoloniality. And decolonization is... Well, de decoloniality, it's a postmodern theory, it's an anti scientific theory, and it's explicitly saying that science was created to oppress. And the point of the examples I'm trying to give is that, well, it wasn't really created that much by, <laughs> it certainly wasn't created to oppress, it was, it was independently created in, in different parts of the world, and it was really created because of people's desire to understand the world that was clearly um how it emerged so that i think is the proper meaning of decoloniality so if you, if you look up decoloniality you can find huge amounts of academic literature on it and it's something that most scientists are completely oblivious to because most scientists just shy away from postmodernism quite understandably because it's entirely anti-scientific um, but that is what decoloniality is and what 
um, the QAA were doing was asking us to embed postmodern thought to take a decolonial view of mathematics. And of course, that's complete, completely antithetical to what most mathematicians would want, because I think most people, most mathematicians think that rational knowledge is beneficial, beneficial to all people and, and wasn't created to oppress. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a uh, you know it's um it's almost as if um you know the well you, you know I I'm I'm interested in this in this uh, in this whole decolonization issue because it's happening in biology as well big time you know I, there's a there, there's a big uh, controversy going on in ornithology now of all things and and uh, it's it's um, uh, and of course, the decolonization issue has been around for many, many years in the sciences. Uh, I'm thinking of the Rose Must Fall movement and you know, in South Africa, and those kinds of things. And and you know, there are two um, really strange aspects of it to me. You know, one is one is rejecting the Europe, what they call the European paradigm of of rational knowledge, uh, of which of course uh, mathematics is the epitome and and of course the other thing is that is that all these decolonization narratives no matter from what discipline uh they always seem to focus on a couple of things you know uh, eugenics is a favorite one you know the the this uh, group of ornithologists that's saying we need to decolonize ornithology goes back to that that, uh, that 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 argument and again it just ignores the entire rich range of uh, of of knowledge that's in all of these fields and and so you know what can you tell us about this rejecting the european paradigm of rational knowledge i mean what's what's the thinking there well, I suppose one thing we ought to agree, you said that mathematics epitomizes, it epitomizes rational knowledge because the complete nonsense is that it's a European paradigm. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, but the I think that what's going on there, um, for example, in all mythology, where people pick on little bits of the history, so you pick on something problematic, and that is actually a postmodern technique called problematization. So again, you can look this up. Foucault recommends the technique of problematization. And it's a way of making people question um, what they're doing. So by mentioning the fact that some Nazis, sorry, <laughs> mathematicians are Nazis, <laughs> you are problematizing their mathematics, you're making people suspicious that perhaps they had ulterior motives for producing that. And the same if you mention eugenics and statistics, do they have ulterior motives for, for, for their statistics? Um, and one can see that that is exactly what the QAA is going for. They're cherry picking from the history of mathematics, something problematic, and one could instead choose entirely positive things from mathematics. So you could talk about Emmy Noether, a woman, she was persecuted by the Nazis, and one could talk about her fabulous contributions to um, mathematics. But the QAA don't want you to do that. They want you to make mathematics look problematic. And if you were interested in making mathematics more appealing to ethnically diverse students, it's really strange to try and emphasize the Nazi mathematicians and the eugenicist mathematicians, when surely you would want to emphasize the international history, the international geniuses of, of mathematics. That seems a far more natural approach to me. Yeah, yeah. And of course, one hates to invoke Godwin's law, but that kind of uh, that kind of thinking actually is exactly what the Nazis were doing. You know, when they do try to define Jewish science and uh, and Jewish mathematics math mathematics and uh, all, all those sorts of things. So, so it's rife with contradictions. This whole decolonization movement. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about the Quality Assurance Agency. You know. Uh, uh, we have accreditation bodies in the United States that governs uh, quality control 
in uh, in our uh, higher education system, and uh, and uh, they 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 can either certify or decertify uh, programs if they if it doesn't meet their their standards. Um, usually, these things have been set by by professionals themselves. You know, engineering accreditation, for example, relies on expertise of engineers but lately we've been seeing these accreditation bodies uh, sort of taking on themselves this uh, crusade to to uh, to bring in diversity equity inclusion and all those other other words uh, now is the QAA a kind of accreditation body um, do they have any kind of authority over higher education like our accreditation bodies do they definitely do in Scotland and they're in a peculiar position in England at the moment. So they used to be an accreditation body, but as a result of Brexit, um, they feel that they can't simultaneously be an accreditation body for Scotland and England. So I think I'm correct in saying, because it's all incredibly complicated and technical at the moment, that the QAA is really just advisory, but there is no current accreditation body to replace it so mm -hmm. it's the de facto standard um, that one would expect mm -hmm. and in practice um these accreditation bodies i haven't come across cases of them shutting down a degree i think what it's more about is setting a tone for universities it's something that external examiners look at it's something that um, university management looks at and the QAA hasn't just changed mathematics. It has for every single university um, degree, it's added in elements of equality, diversity, inclusion, sustainability, and employability and entrepreneurship. And it's done that throughout the whole curriculum. And it's applying a pressure to universities, which they are responding to. So at my own institution, because of these pressures, um, we've introduced a new module, which is called the King's First Year. And it's, it's been trialed, I should say, it hasn't been introduced, but the aim is to be something that's taught to all students. And it covers those three topics. So this is becoming something that it's just assumed will be embedded into a degree. Um, mm -hmm. And so there are aspects of essentially social justice that are being incorporated um, throughout a degree you can't you just can't escape it whatever you want to study if you want to study mm -hmm. music then you're still going to have to perhaps write a song about social <laughs> justice mm -hmm. uh, you, you just can't get away and mm -hmm. obviously lots of mathematicians mm -hmm. lots of people studying maths are doing so because they don't want to talk about politics mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. so yeah yeah. So, who chooses the members of these uh, of the QAA and uh, and the uh, and 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 who appoints the members? Who are they answerable to? I. It's a charity. Um, so I'm not sure, particularly that it's answerable to anyone. The in the past, the panel would be composed of distinguished mathematicians. So the, the panel choosing the um, uh, subject benchmark mathematics. So if you look at it, um, when the original benchmark statement was put up, there were lots of very recognisable names in there. Mm -hmm. And the current panel um, seems to consist mostly of people, not with a research expertise in mathematics, but an expertise in mathematics education. Mm -hmm. So the impression that I get is that it's people who are into education theory and um that is really quite different from what mathematics are, mathematicians are interested in. So the sort of research interest in mathematics is downplayed and the education theory interest in things like critical consciousness and Paolo Freire and that kind of thing mm. is really coming to the fore. Mm. Mm. Is the uh, is, is the uh, addition of these additional kinds of things, is that kind of crowding out the teaching of, of, of mathematics to, the, to your students? I mean, you're finding well, less and less time. Yeah. If you if you have a compulsory module, I mean, right, fortunately it was a pilot. But mm -hmm. if we were to if we end up having a program which is um, covering these areas, it has to force out mathematics. So you yeah. cannot 
teach these things without forcing out mathematics or, or at least impinging upon students' extracurricular activities if you decide to extend things. So the end result just cannot be anything other than some diminishment of the mathematics that students learn. And I have to say, when I've reviewed these things, nobody ever mentions that problem, that the, it's just inevitable that there will be less mathematics. And because there's a tendency, and this is what happened at my own institution, to, um, to try and teach all students the same material, because you know we all need to know equality, diversity and inclusion. We all need to know sustainability. So let's have everybody together to learn it. Seems really efficient. The problem with that is that we've got such diverse students. So we've got students with amazing results at school in mathematics. We've got really quality students on our mathematics program. I, I don't want to pick on the, the programs within my college, but they now all have the same standard. And so you're putting students together with completely different backgrounds, teaching them the same thing. Well, you cannot do that without lowering standards. And the experience that I've seen um, is that the standards have really dropped to what I would consider below university level. And that's, that's kind of inevitable because you can't assume any prerequisites of the students. So you've got to go back to school level so that you can, you can build on that. Hmm. What kinds of reactions are you getting from your students about this, this whole issue? Our students don't seem to care. This is the truth. So um, in mathematics, so I'm talking about mathematics students, they are not interested in identity politics. So I, I discussed with them the various options that one might have for what they'd be interested in learning in the first year. So they, they like the idea of maybe learning something other than mathematics. They think that might be a good way to develop. But when I mentioned to them the idea that they could do a computing course, they actually got excited. Hmm. Um, now, admittedly, this is a conversation with the kind of student who comes to your staff student liaison meetings, and they're perhaps more enthusiastic about <laughs> doing computing than the entire student body. But, you know, they, they really like that idea. And I just don't think that they're as engaged and excited in issues of social justice as seems to be assumed by people who, who believe that incorporating social justice in the curriculum will excite mm. everyone. Mm. And I haven't seen any evidence at all that minority students are more excited by these issues. Mm. So the idea that incorporating that into our curriculum will be good for minority students, I think, is just completely unevidenced. Mm. Um, mm. And uh, of course, one of the heartening things about the response to your to your article in the Spectator, I thought, was that uh, unlike the common response for academics over here, uh, you had a lot of support not only from colleagues in your college but also from colleagues across the UK. Um, and uh, I thought that was very heartening. Would you care to to give us some insight into into that? Well, so I, I wrote to a large number of mathematicians. Um, and I'm pleased to say that very few of them wrote back with anything critical. Um, and we we got, I made the, the letter that they signed was really very strongly worded. Mm -hmm. um, so I was really excited to get as many people to sign it as we did, you know, they, and they, they were very prestigious mathematicians. Um, and I was particularly pleased to get quite quite a few women signed it as well. Um, and as I say, quite a few of my minority colleagues. So I, I felt a real sense of support. I know it's not universal, of course. You know, there are plenty of people who ha have different views. Um, and the, the I was disappointed by what the London Mathematical Society, that they also commented on the benchmark, and they, they were not nearly as critical as um, I, I would hope them to be. So they, they didn't like the word decolonize. They thought not mentioning Nazis was, sorry, mentioning Nazis, we shouldn't be mandated. But they didn't seem to see the risks of incorporating a social justice perspective throughout the curriculum. So although I got plenty of support, 
it is still true that say the London Mathematical Society um, is not backing this. And I think when you ask me what my what my students think, so what our students in the mathematics department think, mm. the, the pushback is more coming from um, the administration within the university and particularly equality, diversity and inclusion function. So if I receive hostility, I'm receiving it not from students, I'm receiving it from staff and I'm receiving it quite directly from um, people people working within equality, diversity and inclusion. So they're, they're the people who, who don't like um, the, these things being questioned. But again, even so, that I wouldn't like to say there's a monolithic equality, diversity and inclusion position because I, I know a lot of people who work in that area um, and especially um, the black people I know who work in that area are actually really quite frustrated that equality, diversity, and inclusion work is all the effort is is going on something completely pointless. I mean, there is nothing more pointless than decolonizing mathematics because it is <laughs> not colonialist. And how can, how can we be, be wasting effort on that when we it's not as though we don't have problems with um, representation of black students you know we really could be going out there and doing something valuable we could be going out there and doing outreach work for example widening participation work yeah in, in my view that's what we should be doing and we're being distracted by unevidenced ideas you know the we're being asked to look at the idea of introducing a module on the history of mathematics. That, that might be really interesting, yeah. but mm -hmm. is it really going to make a difference for our minority mm -hmm. students? Yeah, yeah. So, where do things stand right now with this with this uh, with this set of recommendations? Or, or has, has anyone <laughs> backed off? The consultation's closed. I had a look on the websites, and there, there's nothing. So, we'll find out soonish they i think they said mm -hmm. in february there's not that much of it left so yeah. we may find out um and they, they're currently consulting on um an english proposal so they're they've certainly kept in the new english proposal they've still got those same areas mm -hmm. and um, you can read that apparently the way in which learning english helps you save the planet and yeah. the way that English degrees okay. apparently help you mm -hmm. hugely employable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, but you see kind of the same thing. You know, I've seen a number of proposals to, for English degrees. Uh, you don't have to read a word of Shakespeare to be able to get an English degree. And it sounds like it might be a similar kind of thing to this thing crowding out actual mathematics, uh, you know, and again, as at the behest of not actual real mathemat mathematicians, but of course, the mathematics educators, whatever that is. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, you, you see the same thing in physics, you know, for example, there was a very famous um, article that came out about a year ago in, uh, in one of the journals of the American Physical Society. And, and of course, it, it was about whiteness in physics and how we have to purge physics of whiteness. And, and uh, it publishes some of the most uh, um, incredibly silly studies. Uh, it, and this is in a journal of the American Physical Society. But, you know, even then they have put it off into a separate journal, you know, the journal, American Journal of Physics Education. And, and, uh, and that's where a lot of these uh, things seem to come from on this side. And of course, what you're saying is it's happening are there as well. So, uh, is is uh, uh, mathematics education becoming a becoming a, a a kind of profession with with uh, actual clout that they can actually have power over over people actually doing mathematics? Well, it, it seems to be in the sense that they're certainly managing to affect the QAA, and they're certainly it would seem beginning to make inroads into being able to suggest modules so while we are resisting this i would say at my own institution you can see that other institutions in the uk have embraced um decolonization so you you can 
find plenty of institutions where they may have a number of people working on um, decolonizing the mathematics curriculum. So that that, that is mm-hmm. clearly happening. And there is certainly a, a move to increasing the number of people on educational pathways within universities rather than the traditional research and education pathway. So, so that, that is certainly happening. But within, within my own department, um, we're still very much research focused. So mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. we've spotted this early in, mm-hmm. in mathematics, yeah, whereas you can see that in English, they have been um, really going along with this agenda for a long time. And, you know, the problem that they have there is that it's really beginning to affect academic freedom. So in English, it makes no sense to say you must take a decolonial perspective because you would hope that many different perspectives would would be taken. And I think that's actually worse than one is concerned about perhaps people don't get to study Shakespeare anymore. But the real concern is saying you must take a particular perspective that that's just should never be happening in a university. And yeah. again, that's that was there in this QAA proposal. They say we must take a decolonial view. And they're, they're really looking to change the beliefs of educators. They feel that we must believe in decolonization and these other social justice. I put yeah. that in inverted commas because you know it's just a very particular, very narrow view of what social justice might mean. And they insist. Yeah. That everybody believes on that so i think that's that, that's the real problem is that it's trying to control what we think and yeah. then you can if you look at it from that perspective then you can start to see the wider attempts to control what we're thinking within the university so while yeah. the mathematics department we may still have um a lot of control over our research and we have a lot of control over our curriculum we are increasingly being told what to think so we have equality, diversity, and inclusion um, departments, functions that are telling us all about our unconscious biases. And in my institution, and it's, it's, well, let's talk about Imperial, actually. Let's talk about Imperial. They have mm-hmm. um, pages from their human resources departments telling them that they should all be white allies. And what a white ally is, is somebody who accepts that um, they have white privilege um, and basically just goes along with the entirety of critical race theory. That is what a white ally is. And that's being advertised, that's being promoted at Imperial is what really all staff should do. Their human human resources department is saying, really encouraging people to follow that. Similarly, they have pages on LGBTQ plus allyship which means that you should go along with the entirety of queer theory. And then when you fill in your um, promotion application, there's a section saying, what have you been doing for equality, diversity and inclusion? And you're simultaneously getting messages saying that you should be an LGBTQ plus ally, you should be a white ally. And it makes a very clear statement that you're meant to believe certain things and it's unacceptable not to believe it. So I think that's the real sense in which in the UK universities, at least in science departments, that's how we're getting affected, being being told we must believe certain things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned things like the diversity statements for uh, applications for promotion, and if it's anything like what's happening here, you also have that for uh, uh, faculty um, hiring as well. No, but... Actually, that doesn't happen so much over here. It does. It's something I've looked at, and I, have, I think it probably is happening occasionally, mm-hmm. but that mm-hmm. hasn't happened so much. And I think it okay. almost certainly won't happen now, but fortunately, we have quite strong employment protection in the UK Uh and lots of these beliefs it's now becoming clear they're protected in law so hopefully um that won't happen so much so I think we've fortunately managed to dodge that one Um, that's good that's that's good you know uh, 
because you know one of the one of the contrasts between what's happening in the U.S. and what uh, what you described in your article was that you actually had effective pushback uh, from 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 colleagues and and uh, uh, when you look at uh, the response for uh, similar pushback here, almost no one does it. Uh, you know, we uh, we talk about the protections of tenure, which is actually a very vague concept. It's 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 mainly uh, just sort of a, a vague tradition rather than something that's enshrined in law. And um, you know, I I think that may explain some of the differences. You know, the 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 failure to push back on the part of U.S. academics versus what's happening happening there. So so is 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 tenure still a viable concept, and is it protected by law and clearly defined in the U.K. or because uh, it's not so well defined here? Well, um, we we have quite a different system. Um, so yeah. you tend to get a permanent job a little bit sooner. And um, we do yeah. have some degree of employment protection, but I, I don't. I we get the impression that tenure in the US is stronger as a protection than what we really? have. Really, but okay. I think the um. The analysis that you mostly hear in the UK for why there's a big difference is because of the political polarization of the US of mm. um, Republicans and Democrats. And that in the UK, we have managed to have left wing thinkers um, taking very prominent positions against um, these kinds of ideologies. And that, that particularly applies to um, queer theory. So we've got a really strong um, intellectual and left-wing uh, movement against um, ideas from queer theory and putting gender identity theory into law. And that, that, that has been having huge impacts in the UK. Whereas in the US, I think the accusation that everybody who does this is right-wing, everybody who believes this is a fascist, it has a bit more force. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why people feel uncomfortable. Mm. So that, it, to us, it looks as though because you do in the US have such major problems with um, race inequality, that it makes it so much harder for anybody to question moves to improve race equality without looking a big at it. Whereas yeah. perhaps we can just be a little bit more comfortable because we don't we don't have that recent legacy of slavery, for example. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't had segregation as recently as the US, and so we're a little bit. It, it, it's less of a difficult issue for us. I think mm -hmm. that may be one of the main reasons, because because certainly people have been losing their jobs um, in the UK. So like, I certainly know of people who've lost their jobs over questioning queer theory. That has happened. Mm. But perhaps it hasn't happened to the same extent as in the US. So mm. perhaps, you know, once you see it happen, it's obviously very scary. If you see yeah. it happen, you, then you'll really think twice about speaking out, whereas yeah. perhaps it's a bit more obscure in the UK where it's occurred. Yeah, yeah. And of course, uh, you know, it... There's no doubt we have a very uh, politically polarized society right now, but the but the curious thing there is that in academia it's 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 almost a monoculture of the of the uh, of 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 the left in academia right now, and it's uh, um, you know it's really kind of a kind of a uh, uh, kind of a power politics thing that's going on in the U.S. that's sort of imposing this this uh, this the, this ideology on on the academy and there's almost no one left to fight back and the few that do find themselves actually actually uh, uh, either having their lives being made very unpleasant or or various kinds of pretexts to come in and uh, and and revoke tenure and and so you know it's a um, uh, it, it's 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 very much a power play and it's very much a power play to as you said earlier impose a political agenda on areas where really the politics has no has no place like and the exa exemplar of that is is mathematics and so 
you know, you 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 mentioned in your article that you know you were sure that they were uh, coming in with the best of intentions and making these uh, suggestions, but uh, but but was it really the best of intentions? Are they really g engaging in a power play to basically take the field of say mathematics away from the mathematicians and to turn it well, into a political instrument? I think that they are trying to take. Um, <laughs> certainly education away from uh, mathematicians. But I think they are trying to do that with the best of intentions. I just completely disagree with them. Uh -huh. um, the, you can buy textbooks called things like mathematics, mathematics education for social justice. Uh -huh. And I personally believe that the purpose of mathematics education should be simply to educate people. So I... When I learned mathematics, I just wanted to learn about the world, how it works. And I, I there's also just sheer personal development. I wasn't really interested in instrumental reasons for learning mathematics. And clearly, if people talk about mathematics for social justice, they've got a totally different view there. They see the objective of education to be to promote social justice. And this, this is completely explicit in mm -hmm. Paulo Freire is absolutely clear that the purpose of education for him is social justice. And I just simply don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right, I think, that there is a power play to say that education should be repurposed to meet this specific political agenda. And I think it's quite deliberate that people are going in and, you know, volunteering to work for the QA on the subject benchmark so that they can incorporate these ideas. A lot, lot of these ideas actually come all the way from um, UNESCO. So the UNESCO has a program called Education for Sustainable Development. Mm -hmm. And when you look into that, it's not just about climate change. It's about broader social justice issues. And so people have managed to get themselves right to the top um, the non-governmental organisations are very clearly, deliberately trying to spread this this approach throughout education. And um, I still think they're trying to do it. I think I, I'm, I'm not trying to be say they're fundamentally immoral people, but I yeah. think that they're very, very wrong about what yeah. the purpose of education is. And yeah. I think that they're indoctrinating people and. They're just comfortable with indoctrination. So, for example, Paulo Freire, who I've mentioned a couple of times, this mm -hmm. Brazilian educator is much more well-known, I think, in the US than he is in yeah. the UK. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely... What, what, what he argues is that if you don't essentially indoctrinate about social justice, you'll just be passively indoctrinating about um, the status quo. So you'll be mm -hmm. bringing up a next generation of neoliberal um, capitalists so therefore it's not morally wrong to indoctrinate because you can't avoid indoctrination mm. whatever you do you'll be indoctrinating well i, I don't buy that argument mm. in mathematics it seems just obvious nonsense you know if i am teaching somebody a course about prime numbers how on earth am i embedding the capitalist status quo it's, it's a ridiculous argument but people sincerely believe it, and that's that's where they come from. I think they're absolutely explicit that that is their own. Yeah, yeah, and really, uh, you know, so much for standing on the shoulders of giants. You know, as <laughs> Newton, Newton put it. You know, the idea is to pull the pull those giants down, and uh, I think that opens up the field for the politicization of uh, of fields where really politics yeah. has no no business being. I and mean, what we should be doing, in my view, is mathematizing. All those other fields. That, that's yeah. that's what I want to see. Happen. Yes, <laughs> yes, good point. Yes, very good point. Yeah, I, mean, I would uh, I would agree with you, especially when it comes to our understanding of risk and mathematics and uh, and and all those kinds of things, because the the uh, the, uh, the the knowledge of of understanding how to evaluate risks compared to one another uh, is abysmal here, you know, and it, it just. Uh, it just doesn't really work very well. So yes, yeah. let's math let's mathematize society rather than but also also mathematics. I think math mathematics. So I, I know as a mathematician, I, I'm aware of the concept of proof. 
Mm-hmm. And I think that most people have never seen a mathematical proof in yeah. their entire life. And I don't think that people really appreciate that there is this thing out there called objective knowledge. Yeah. So you have lots of people in arts disciplines who actually genuinely believe that everything is subjective, mm-hmm. everything is a matter of opinion. And I think it would be really illuminating for them to actually see some mathematics, see some real logic. I mean, it's breathtaking and beautiful, so hopefully they'll... (laughs) Perhaps they might just enjoy it. But it's it's also so supremely important in understanding these debates that not everything is subjective. That's the central tenet of these ideologies, is that things are subjective, there's no external world that we can measure. You know, people genuinely believe that. And if you yeah. see mathematics, you just instantly realize, well, it's nonsense. There's yeah. facts. Yeah, I recall uh, when I was a high school student, what really captivated me, I was an indifferent math student, but re- what really captivated me was 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 the concept of geometric proof, you know? You know, how yeah. you analyze, try, you know, I just thought that was a real eye opener uh, for me, you know, and of course, uh, um, <clears throat> if you don't believe that, if there's no uh, actual objective knowledge, then you really have no reason for science to exist. And then we're right back to, right back to, uh, you know, basically a barbarian society, it seems to me. So anyway, so. Um, okay, so we're uh, we've got quite a number of uh, questions uh, uh, piling up. Uh, uh, John, did you have any anything else you wanted to add before we uh, before? No, we I'm, I'm happy to uh, yeah, talk about the questions. Yeah, I thought this was a fantastic uh, discussion. Uh, just one thing for the audience: that so we have a number of uh, of, of questions coming in, uh, several from the chat, and we'll try to get through those as much as we can. And normally we like uh, people to um, put in uh, their comments in the Q&A because that enables a bit more uh, participation by the audience. You can answer questions and whatnot. But let's uh, let's start going through the, uh, the the chat first. I think everyone should be able to to see it. There were several questions about uh, what's QAA. Um, one of the problems I was having difficulty actually typing in the chat, so I couldn't answer. But it's a quality assurance agency for higher education in the in the UK. Um, yeah, so just to uh, clear that up a little bit. Um, okay, so um, Deborah Glazer, she says, well, why not fight back by using examples of progress in medical devices and drugs to show increased lifespan around the world and hence social justice or better techniques of food production, for example? Um, I'm trying to parse that. Um, uh, I mean, I, I, I think what she means is that uh, we have uh, social justice coming from scientific progress, not so much from politicization of, 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 of medical practice and medical devices. I think that's, that's what uh, uh, she means there. And this comes back to this whole issue of, you know, do we stand on the shoulders of giants or do we just ignore everything that, that they did in, in light of this new, you know, supposedly better way of looking at the world? Um, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, the, the, there, there's a, a strange inconsistency that on, on the one hand, you will see people being tremendously anti-scientific sometimes and just going against very basic scientific values. But the same people, they're happy to be inconsistent. And of course, this, this is, reason, if you don't believe in rationality, being inconsistent is not a problem. And, you know, pe- people are very happy to use science. So the, the, you, w- w- when discussing these issues with people, though, and if people take a social justice perspective, of course they're very happy with um, medical advancement and they'll talk about medical advancement. And when you're having that discussion, it all seems very reasonable. I mean, there's vast amounts of discussions of sustainability which are entirely reasonable. There are vast aspects of um, attempting to improve diversity and inclusion that are completely reasonable. But it's really these these very core arguments, these fundamental philosophies, which when you dig into it, that's that's where the problem occurs. And it's the objection is to being told to teach this 
the, the these very specific philosophies. So I completely agree with the comment that you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. there's so yeah. much great stuff from medicine. It, the evidence that science is beneficial is overwhelming. Yeah, nobody yeah. can deny it. No, nobody dares say that out loud that science is negative. It's because it's obviously ridiculous. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And of course, uh, you know, you you mentioned that um, uh, most uh, most scientists that I know, and I'm sure most of your colleagues as well, they 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 have no issue at all with uh, bringing in anyone who wants to study mathematics, no matter no matter what. And uh, one of the one of the techniques that has been used here is to actually redefine uh, what these nice sounding terms, diversity, uh, inclusion, you know, these all sound very wonderful, but they actually mean very different things. You know, diversity is racial quotas, inclusion is the same thing. Uh, we don't talk about equality here, we talk about equity because that means that everyone can be, is gonna end up the same. And if we don't do, uh, if we don't do that, if that's not happening, then we're somehow guilty of uh, racism and uh, or any of a number of other social sins. Um, okay, so uh, Alexander Alexander Borovic has an interesting comment. Uh, gives us a link to an article in Archive about decolonization of the curricula, and he mentions linear algebra in there. And uh, uh, I don't know if you know this uh, article, but. Uh, um, it's just kind of interesting that uh, this has penetrated to this side as well. The person who wrote this is from Cornell, apparently. Um, and uh, George Andrews mentions that uh, the American Mathematical Society is embroiled in this as well. Um, and uh, to the point that a counter organization has been formed uh, that is devoted entirely to mathematics research. And so they've sort of abandoned the American Mathematical Society. So um, th- there's there's similar societies in Great Britain as well, uh, you know, and, uh, and so um, are your societies uh, supporting you? Uh, I think you mentioned uh, one well, thing. So the London Mathematical Society, it, despite the name London, it is the, I yeah. think, the UK Mathematical Society. Um, and they did make some changes. Um, so they did make, they did have some critical comments to the QAA. Um, and we've got other societies, such as the Royal Society. Um, I don't know what their comments were like. And I think we will see when the... Um, um at, at the end of the consultation my my my, my guess and it's you know we, mm-hmm. we can test my hypothesis i think the word decolonization is going to go mm-hmm. but i don't think we're going to see mm-hmm. much difference other than that so they, they sort of slipped up probably when they used the decolonization word yeah, and yeah. when they mentioned nazis but i i don't think that it is fully understood um in the uk what what the rest of the agenda is i don't think i think we're, we're beginning to understand but scientists mm-hmm. don't don't keep up with politics very much um, that's right yeah. <laughs> they like to yeah. do science yeah, yeah, yeah. most most of my colleagues the overwhelming attitude of my colleagues is thank you for doing this job because yeah i don't want yeah. to have to think about it that's and cool. yeah. um so i think people are a little bit slow to understand how things are changing so it's easy to fall for things like sustainability you know because everybody thinks that we don't want to destroy the planet and what they don't realize is that sustainability has been redefined to mean something that has got nothing to do with sustainability at all but it includes um, gender identity equality and that kind of thing you know it's just yeah. general general themes of social justice yeah yeah but uh, it sounds like there's no um uh, insurgency among the mathematics societies in britain as this uh, person is describing here for the, yeah well I, we'd, i'd like to start one um, okay all right one. i think all right. I, I think we've be, you know we've just had I think this letter which showed intent. We had we, there was another interesting letter which I also signed, which was um we have we have a freedom of expression in higher education bill, 
which is currently going through Parliament in the UK. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, it's clearly very specifically designed to make sure that everybody can be very comfortable about talking about these issues um, and they can present a counter view. Mm -hmm. And the intention was that, that part, part, part of the act says that universities must defend academic freedom. And if mm -hmm. they fail to do so, you can actually take them to court. You can sue them. And um, in our complicated system in the House of Lords, they changed it and they got rid of the ability to sue. Wow. And a group of mathematicians, um, I'm not saying it's the mathematicians only that did it, mm -hmm. but a group mm -hmm. of mathematicians yes. wrote to the minister yeah. and they have um, restored the ability to sue into the Act. So I think that's going to be passed. And so... You, uh, you can see there is a growing um, body of mathematicians who are understanding this issue and a growing body of scientists mm. who understand this issue. And it's driven, I think, largely because of the um, case of Kathleen Stock. Do you know about that case over in the US? She was at um, Sussex University and mm -hmm. she is... Mm -hmm outspoken against um queer theory and oh, yes, I theory. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. and she was subject to um an enormous campaign of harassment going on um several years i think um, i think i'm right that it took it took a few years and it, it culminated in students sort of blocking the entrance to the university with um, banners saying that so she must be sacked and things and letting off smoke bombs Hmm. And the university then realised, well, we're going to get really heavily sued for this because mm -hmm. at that point it was clear that she's being discriminated against for her beliefs. And it's assumed that she got a very nice settlement. And this really hit the headlines in the UK. And it's something that a lot of academics were interested in. And I think it had quite an emotional impact for people because you often read about cancellation and I don't think people realise that it's a human that is getting cancelled. Yes. I think that it was it was the images of these you know masked thugs with smoke bombs targeting one person, just one woman. Yeah. And yeah. I think that re really had quite an emotional resonance for people. So yeah. I think I think that's one of the, been one of the big catalysts in the UK for a change of view because it, it there's clearly a growing change of view in the UK. You, you as I say in the UK, it's mostly about the gender identity issue. Um, critical race theory hasn't made it um, as successfully across the Atlantic so far. It's, mm -hmm. it, we can feel it coming, we can see it, but the mm -hmm. gender identity theory has had a huge impact and you're seeing real pushback. So um, yeah. on Wednesday, Nicola Sturgeon, the First Minister of Scotland, essentially had to resign um, because she was trying to push forward reforms on gender identity so people could choose their own sex. And mm -hmm. um, you can you can see a huge change that's happening in the UK. Yeah, yeah. She sounds like Catherine Stock sounds like uh, your Amy Wax, who's going through a similar ordeal here, okay. but with actually much less support from her administration. And I, I don't know, I think well, uh, maybe we could have a benefit from being able to sue our universities for failing to protect our academic freedom because they're. I think, I think you would failing. benefit heavily from. Yeah. Um, our equality law. So you can't be sacked for um, quite, quite a number of protected characteristics, including beliefs. And yes. we, we're really benefiting from that. We'd like your yeah. free speech laws, I think. That'd be quite good. I Okay. <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, they're not helping us very much these days. Right. <laughs> so, so we, so we want to keep them, but uh, they're under assault. Uh, yeah. So I've been making a number of uh, uh, disparaging comparisons between the courage of, uh, of UK academics versus what's going on here. And uh, William Buss uh, comes along and uh, corrects me about this strong statement uh, against an effort by 1,200 California-based academics, researchers, and others in STEM fields, uh, basically coming out against this whole decolonization thing. So I would urge everyone to uh, have a look at that, uh, at the link that he helpfully uh, provides. It's in the independent. Um, uh, let's see, Neil Ann 
Um, unfortunately, his last name is, uh, or her last name is uh, cut off. Uh, it says they want everything to be subjective because uh, there was something like objective proof might be used to prove their social justice theories are wrong. We can't have that. And it sounds like that's kind of what's going on uh, behind the scenes and all <laughs> all of these things, excuse me. And, uh, let's see. And then uh, uh, Iris Strauss um, talks about his son's 10th grade math text and has DIE language in its intro. Uh, not yet in the main text, but it's in the intro. Is it likely to get worse by the time he gets into college? So this is uh, this is kind of a uh, um, um, question about, you know, what's the what's the what's the timeline here? And uh, so what does uh, tenth know, grade mean? You have to educate me. How old? Uh, oh, okay, usually about uh, 15, 16 years old. Okay. It's the second second uh, year in our four year high school uh, uh, um, okay. uh, program, typically. Yeah. So, so that's what's uh, there. And uh, of course, um, he wants. He says he wants to study math in part for the reason I once did. It's about truth, and we've discussed that. But uh, of course, I think the real question is, what do you see as the timeline for this? Uh, do you see? And you know, do you? I think you're hoping. We're all hoping that the timeline is that this thing ends in defeat. But you know, what 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 are the political forces at uh, at play here? Do you think that academics will uh, will be um, suppressed on this? Well, I'm 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 ridiculous optimist. Um, so you can discount my predictions. But yeah. what what what's clear is that there's a real acceleration in the UK. Um, yeah. So in 2019, it was ruled that saying that you can't change your sex was a belief that wasn't worthy of respect in a democratic society. So that was 2019, and people thought that was the law so that you couldn't mm -hmm. sack people for that belief. Mm -hmm. And I think it was 20, 2021 that um, that was appealed, and now it's a legally protected belief. So you can't sack people for it. And in fact, mm -hmm. so this, everything is reversed. EDI mm -hmm. now has to defend that belief. They hate it with gritted teeth. <laughs> <laughs> they defend your, your freedom mm -hmm. and to hold that belief. Yeah. And as a result of that, we saw a cascade of organisations leaving um, Stonewall, which is our main LGBTQ plus charity that's been really pushing a gender identity agenda. And then it's accelerated and accelerated till we see Nicola Sturgeon, um, First Minister of Scotland, losing her job over the issue. So mm -hmm. I, I see a real acceleration there. And so we seem in quite a positive place in the UK on that issue. And I think that issue helps educate people about the other issues because they can just see the parallels um, mm -hmm. between critical race theory and gender mm -hmm. identity theory. They're being pushed by the same people. Mm -hmm. Time frame for the US, I haven't a clue. It yeah. looks to us, um, yeah, I didn't know about this 1,200 plus signatures, which is absolutely fantastic. Mm. Um, but then, nor did you. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> so the, it looks, it yeah. looks as though things are much more embedded in the US. I mean, for example, I, I don't. Did you know that in the US, your census doesn't collect data on sex? Did you know that? I did not know that. I did so, not know that. I just learned something. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, so in the UK, we pushed yeah. back on that, and so in England, uh -huh. in England, we succeeded. So our census yeah. collects data on sex. In Scotland. They don't collect data on sex. We didn't succeed there. In in the US, they, they collect data on current sex, which is self-identified. In other words, mm -hmm. not sex at all. Um, and the there's a site, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine in the US, they have published a statement. Uh, so they published a paper on collecting data on gender identity and sex. And that says that by default, you should collect data on gender identity and we don't need data on sex. Um, so that sort of, that feels to us like really embedded in the US in significant science organisations. You have real mm -hmm. queer theory, mm -hmm. agenda that's been embedded in serious things. And that's, that's obvious. Well, in my view, that's very detriment, detrimental to science. And um, I, I, I'm very aware of what's happening now. Shit, I don't know quite how 
deeply things are embedded with um, critical race theory. We, in the UK, I, it just isn't deeply embedded. I think we may be able mm -hmm. to push back against that. So we've had years in universities of a thing called the Athena Swan Charter, which is all about gender equality, and that's been converted into, to a large extent, looking after gender identity. So they changed the definition of sex there, and it's really mm -hmm. changed the emphasis mm -hmm. of that organisation. But our equivalent race equality charter just has never really got any traction. Um, yes. And so critical race theory hasn't been embedded. It, I mean, it, which isn't to say that we shouldn't be doing more about racism, because actually, I think that's one, one of the most significant concerns that we should be having within the sciences is the lack of representation of mm. um, ethnic minorities in the UK. But very little has been done about that. It's yeah. all yeah. tokenistic. Um, yeah, so yeah. Uh, Neilan Parks, who's uh, submitted several questions, he makes an interesting, another interesting point, actually, um, that uh, one of the one of the outcomes of this focus on race and uh, and uh, gender identity and all these sorts of things is that is that because you have different levels of performance on mathematics, that that uh, you're ending up with uh, school children black school children being put into separate classes and being taught different things from other school children. So we're almost getting back to a kind of uh, de facto segregation of, of, uh, of the races here. And, and uh, uh, that's kind of a troubling uh, thing. Are you seeing, are you seeing a similar pressure in the UK that, uh, you know, we, we need to teach uh, uh, black students differently from Indian students differently from white students? Uh, there. Fortunately, I have never heard that idea in the UK, which is a tremendous relief. I mean, I guess what's yes. being hinted at is that, that it may happen um, as a um, de facto thing just from if you have really significant social mm -hmm. class differences mm -hmm. resulting in those changes. Uh, but I think that that perhaps happens more at the level of schools than mm -hmm. at the level of setting within schools. So mm -hmm. you you have some communities that are predominantly one race and other communities that are predominantly another. So I think that's where where the differences are likely to occur rather yeah. rather than setting within schools. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it would uh, be illegal, fortunately. I think. Well, it's illegal here too, but they're yeah, still doing yeah. it. You know. So <laughs> anyway, but I'm mean, probably slightly <laughs> wrong. If you, I think if you could if you could come up with a justification of why it was an appropriate measure to take. And you might be able to get away with it, but I, I wouldn't try it myself. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. Okay, let's go to the Q and A now. There are eight uh, eight uh, open uh, comments there. So, um, Terry Gannon, he has a couple of uh, interesting comments here. Um, you know, are are we really heading to a kind of a tour two tier um, system of science education. Again, this is tying into Neil Ann Park's uh, uh, comments about are we going towards de facto uh, racial and uh, racial segregation again? And, uh, um, uh, you know, I, so this I is just, this is Terry's I, comment about the separate academy and consulting. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, he, he he's he he uh, he puts in several uh, different comments and oh, okay. he's basically asking are we heading to a, a system of accreditation outside meaning separate academy separate consulting yes. groups that sort of thing and he uh, he brings this up uh, also you know are we going to separate journals are we going to separate institutions and academies and uh, and 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 so forth and this is related to what we were just uh, we were just um talking about um yeah so i think i think that the point he's making about this separation of the academic from um, uh, what I would see as managerial oversight or perhaps education theory, mm -hmm. things that aren't research driven, that's definitely happening. I'm definitely seeing um, a growing bureaucracy around um, education. So we, we have organizations like the QAA, we have an organization called Advance HG, which advises and it, it really focuses on these non-academic non-research-led themes and increasingly the curriculum is being taken away i think i think that's absolutely true and the the in a sense i think the two tier the, the two two factions of education i think that's kind of inevitable 
in the um, pick point arts and humanities just are postmodernists. That's, <laughs> I don't think mm-hmm. it's sensible, but mm-hmm. they are postmodernists, and mm-hmm. people in science are not. And um, what we really need to be able to do is live alongside each other. There's no hope of taking arts and humanities faculties and asking them not to be postmodernists. They just that's what they want to do. It's what they see as academically valid. Um, mm. We just need to be able to stop them affecting us. And I think that means that scientists have to understand that they exist within university power structures and they have to stand up it, in those power structures and be aware of, of how things are being manipulated. So I just don't think we're as skilled in campaigning or at least historically haven't been as skilled in campaigning. As the um, as the activists in arts and arts and humanities have been, and so we just need to up our game and start paying attention. So you know we need to make sure that the QAA is not full of people from maths education, but we need to get high profile um, mathematics professors there again, talking about research based mathematics and changing that focus. So unfortunately, we do need to get political. I think. Yeah, yeah. and of course, what struck me is that. Uh... Uh, you know the, the the scientists typically have have had the uh, presumption that oh well you know we're all that kind of stuff is happening over in the crazy uh, liberal arts side of the campus and we don't need to worry about it because we're dealing with real things and we get our yeah. grants and those kind of things and the consequence has been the heads have been in the sand for so long and then they then they wake up and they see uh, oh the world has changed around them and so and so that's that that kind of insularity uh, kind of paradoxical insularity I think has uh, has um, actually damaged uh, science and allowed this agenda to get such a strong foothold in our in our institutions um, yeah, i think that's right yeah and it's 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 almost like we've forgotten what we're here to do you know what scientists and mathematicians are here to do you know it's and uh, we seem to have lost the uh, lost the uh, the the belief almost in that what we do is actually valuable it's different and uh, and uh, all that and uh, so that's a I, 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 that's that I wouldn't agree with. So if I talk when I talk to my okay. colleagues, yeah. the strength of belief they have in what they do, and you know the passion they have for mathematics and the passion they have for communicating mathematics and for researching mathematics is enormous. They are very frustrated at having to do something else which they never expected because I just don't. The idea that education might be taken away for you know the the idea that somebody might say that the purpose of education is now social justice and not personal improvement is something that has never occurred um to most mathematicians and i don't really think it's their job to go and defend Mm -hmm. that i think their job is to do mathematics (laughs) that's what they're skilled at and so you know perhaps it's for people like me who are never going to be uh troubling the field medal committee (laughs) <laughs> to uh, have, to, have to go and do that do that pushback but it it yeah. is really surprising that um university structures have allowed this to happen you know really perhaps the protection should be happening higher up our faculty committees shouldn't they be protecting us um from mm-hmm. this shouldn't the senior management of the college understand that there are these two factions that are never going to agree and make sure that one doesn't impose things on the other. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, I was really struck by music that because they're very light mathematics and um, that can be so alien to all other subjects. The idea of sustainable music is kind of ridiculous. It's just not, not something that you want. And senior management should understand that. They should go, well, when we're dealing with people in music, we shouldn't be imposing the same restrictions we do on everybody else. We shouldn't be forcing them all to think about entrepreneurship for their, their music. It doesn't make sense. Of course, it makes sense for people in engineering. That's exactly what they should be doing. And I think that people in senior positions in colleges have allowed themselves to get swept up by the activism. And I think it's really partly their own, it's a bit of hubris. They, they want us to be part of changing the world for the better 
Um, mm -hmm. There's a bit of vanity, I think, in yeah. trying, trying, to, trying to transform their entire institutions and revolutionize education for social justice. They should yeah. realize that at the ground level in universities, you've got all this incredible talent, and they should be letting the ground level brilliant talent just continue to be talented, continue communicating to students and try and free them from politics. So I don't think it's the people at the bottom level who should be doing this work. I think I think the problem's higher up. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. You know, and the and the uh, uh, of course the dismaying thing in the U.S. is that it's very hard to find a college president, for example, or a board of trustees that that's that that, that actually understands what their role is. You know, to actually protect academic freedom and to take steps to resist the activism and all that uh, all that sort of thing. So, okay. Um, Let's see, here's someone, David Anderson. I don't know if this is pushback or not, but it's related to what we were just talking about. He says, don't we need mathematicians and scientists to educate themselves in politics in order to defend their fundamental beliefs? So um, I think you're saying yes, and but no, you know, we should do math. I think, uh, obviously, than... some have got to do it. It's yeah, interesting yeah. how it, it, it would appear that when mathematicians turn their mind to something, they mm -hmm. are quite... I find it difficult to argue with. They're good at arguing. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I think if you look at um, the really first-rate mathematicians who are out there, um, you know, people who are winning fields medals, people who are winning prizes for their mathematics, it is completely inefficient to ask them to devote their energy to politics. Mm. Um, I actually felt quite bad emailing a lot of the fellows of the Royal Society and so forth that I contacted because I thought I'm wasting their time. Mm. And, and I knew that some of them, so, so a couple of them I knew personally, um, and they're obsessed with mathematics. You know, they really, uh, really abstruse things that I, I, I would struggle to explain. And mm -hmm. the idea that they'd be interested in politics, it's ridiculous to them um, because they're geniuses. And geniuses yeah. should not be wasting their time I on agree. this kind of stuff. They should be doing what their geniuses are. Yeah. But it's true that it would help if people in the sciences understood more about what was going on. We have got to communicate that. And, of course, there are people yeah. in the sciences with broad interests. So there are plenty of people who aren't obsessed with their area and look, look yeah. beyond. And I think they are beginning to understand this. I think... With, They've mostly had a real revulsion to postmodernism. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I, I, I feel this. I, I read, I did a search for every piece of literature on decolonization and mathematics. And I think I got something like 48 hits and I have read them all. Mm -hmm. And it was a horrible experience. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, enjoy I, feel, I, I, feel, I feel your pain. Yes. Okay. I enjoy does. reading things that are true. Yeah. I don't yeah. like reading nonsense. And yeah. it wasn't a hundred percent nonsense, but a very large proportion of it was. And yeah. it, so, of course, mathematicians have allowed postmodernism to occur without engaging with it, because really, what is that to say? It's very difficult to engage in a serious academic way with total nonsense. This, this is the problem. But mm -hmm. we have got to do it, and I do think. Maybe mathematicians have dropped the ball, but really it's people in, say, social sciences, they're the people who've really dropped the ball because there's yeah. complete rubbish happening in social <laughs> sciences and excellent mm -hmm. social science. So you'll get some people doing really rigorous analyses and you'll get people doing absolute nonsense. And I think there's a, there's a, there's a duty for the people doing the serious social science to be more negative towards their colleagues. And I think they've been... We've all been a bit too polite, mm. uh, so I, th I think perhaps we everybody needs to stop being quite so polite in academia. Yeah. But it's always been a problem, right? You know, there have always been people in academia doing nonsense, and in a sense, that's the point of academic freedom. So we don't want to push back too hard. We, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it is a difficult balance. Yeah, yeah, it is. But uh, I take your point that. Uh, that uh, maybe academia is a little too placid, you know, and maybe we should take a leaf from what George Orwell has said, which is that we need a bit more turbulence in our in our institutions. Exactly, me too. So 
Um, okay, so we're reaching the end of our time here. Um, uh, uh, John, do you have any last uh, last thoughts that you want to leave us with? Um, well, I, I, I've got one fact that I thought might be quite interesting was that um, a, a large part of the argument um, in the UK, people think that decolonizing the curriculum should be all about telling people that um, a diverse range of mathematicians um, have contributed to mathematics, so people across the world, exactly as we were discussing before. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's completely true. Um, I don't think that's got anything to do with the theory of decoloniality. Mm -hmm. And I also don't think that there's any evidence that um, people don't realise that diverse people can contribute. And I, I just, one little fact that struck me was that if you have a look on Wikipedia for the biopics of mathematicians, mm -hmm. there have been 17 biopics of mathematicians. Uh -huh. yeah. And yeah, who are they of? They're of Ramanujan. Ramanujan has two films. Of course he does, because Ramanujan's an interesting guy. Yeah, yeah. Alan Turing, he's kind of got two films. So mm -hmm. he's got one that's about him, and there's one that's about a fictionalized version of him. It's called Tom Jericho, who's heterosexual. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. don't okay. know how to yeah. Yeah. That artistic license, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, films about women mathematicians, films about uh, disabled mathematicians. So Stephen Hawking has two mm -hmm. films about mm -hmm. him. Um, so 17 films. I would say that 13 of the principal characters are diverse. Mm -hmm. One of them is the fiction, well, the, the remaining four, one is Tom Jericho, who's a fictionalised Alan Turing. Mm -hmm. Descartes, I cannot say anything about Descartes. He is totally boring. He's a complete... <laughs> okay. Um, okay. <laughs> um, then the remaining two are Feynman and Paul Erdosh. Okay. And yeah. they're both Jews. Well, they're both ethnically Jewish. Yes. And so generally people ignore completely the idea of Jews as a minority population in mathematics. If you take that into account, mathematics is heavily dominated by um, minority contributions. What Jews have done for mathematics is absolutely unbelievable, and we should be celebrating that. Mm. Anyway, so Paul O'Dosh and Feynman, and the, what, what amused me is I had a look for um, the sexuality of these um, remaining mathematicians yeah. And so Descartes, I think, was heterosexual, had a child. Mm -hmm. Yes. And mm -hmm. Paul Erdos um, did not. And the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology lists Paul Erdos as one of their LGBTQ plus um, huh. heroes of science because okay. they think he's asexual. Okay. So he, mm -hmm. he, he roamed the world visiting other mathematicians. Yeah. He lived from a yes. suitcase his entire life. Uh -huh. And as far as we know, he never had a girlfriend. So there you are. He's LGBTQ plus. is part of the uh, the spectrum of unusual mathematicians. So okay. what you're seeing, of course, it's not surprising, really, is it, that Hollywood, when it talks about mathematicians, talks about you know the more interesting life stories. And yeah. I just don't buy the idea that people think that mathematics isn't for them. You know, the the evidence that people are seeing constantly is that it's a really welcoming subject. And that yeah. really appreciates the contributions of everybody. You know, yeah. the contributions of Jews has always been appreciated, despite the fact that there's you know, historically been rampant anti Semitism throughout the world. Because yeah. what can you do in that? It's yeah. true. It's true. Yeah. It's true. <laughs> it's true. That's right. Yeah. Was uh, John Nash on your list? John Nash, yeah, he's yeah, he's there. So he's I forgot to list yeah. neurodiversity. But I mean, uh -huh. really, yes. okay. all mathematicians are neurodiverse, right? But John Nash <laughs> yes, is hospitalized with schizophrenia, so you yes. know that's, that's yes. a really serious yeah. issue for him. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Okay, well, uh, John, it's been a wonderful uh, conversation. I've certainly enjoyed talking to you, and I hope our audience. Uh, uh, did well. I know our audience did uh, because we have lots of uh, interesting uh, uh, comments. So thank you, John, for joining us. Um, let me just uh, uh, sign out with um, 
a comment from uh, Si Chiaffi, uh, and this is a little bit of a plug for our organization here. Is, uh, doesn't the National Association of Scholars need more STEM members? And yes, I agree completely with that. That's part of my my remit here. And could we discuss this at the next NAS uh, annual meeting? I have a better offer for any scientists who are listening. Uh, uh, National Association of Scholars is going to have a a booth uh, at the American Association for Advancement of Science meeting in Washington on March uh, 3rd to the 5th. Uh, by all means, come and see us and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, you can see the kinds of things that NAS is doing to increase STEM membership because we think that uh, absolutely uh, the sciences are as much under assault uh, uh, as uh, any of the other uh, issues in the academy. So, so please do join us and uh, there won't be a restoring the sciences um, next week, uh, because I'll be traveling, uh, we'll be broadcasting something from the AAAS meeting, uh, first uh, couple days of March, and then the next Restoring the Sciences will be on the 10th of March, and we have a very interesting uh, uh, group of people from uh, Bakersfield, uh, the Renegade Alliance, uh, a similar story to, to you, John, uh, uh, a, 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 an alliance of faculty who have pushed back against an overweening administration. So uh, that's what's coming up. And uh, again, John, thanks so much for joining us. We had a great time. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Good night, everyone.